This is Our View, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees, the people who work for you. Thirty years ago, thanks to the Federation's long legal struggle, thousands of women employed by the state of Washington got pay raises. The issue was comparable worth, which looked at the value of the work performed. This case had implications for the entire nation and still does today. Never quit is a slogan we're hearing a lot today. It was never more true than in our 13-year fight for comparable worth. Our out-of-court settlement brought pay equity adjustments that started 30 years ago on April 25, 1986. Hi, I'm Tam Tosher, AFSCME's Area Director for the Northwest Area. I worked for the Federation or Council 28 when the comparable worth fight went into high gear. I was at the federal court for the trial on our comparable worth lawsuit against the state. I had a front row seat then and later to see how our efforts brought a fair helping of decency to the working men and women of Washington State. Here now is a look back as we mark the 30th anniversary of our Comparable Worth Day and all that led up to it. Remember, it's not just a history lesson, but a lesson for today and for our future. September 16th, 1981, apparently not satisfied with the pace of the Comparable Worth study, Federation leaders announced at news conferences in Spokane and Seattle a formal complaint was being filed with the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission charging the state with sex-biased wage discrimination, a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Even then, the bureaucratic machinery didn't move, so after six months with no action from the EEOC, the Federation went to federal district court. I, I do remember the judge was always very candid. Judge Tanner was very candid. Uh, he seemed to share some of his thoughts with, with those in the courtroom. And he was quite amazed when he found out that the beautician for the state made less than the barber working for the state. Two years to the day after announcing legal action, Judge Jack Tanner found the state guilty of discrimination. The state could no longer just study comparable worth. Oh, but these days their number is growing by leaps and bounds. And it raises the question, shouldn't a woman's work be worth as much as a man's? Shouldn't she be paid at the same level? Tonight our chief correspondent Richard Threlkel continues his status reports on women in American society. American women now have equal pay for equal work, at least on paper. It's part of the civil rights law. On paper, but not in practice. Today, full-time working women make just 62 cents for every dollar a man makes. And that's important because for the first time, more women than not, 53%, are working outside the home. Because they have to, in most cases, and they're aware they're being shortchanged compared to men. First, they were paid more, and then their annual raises were larger than ours, and that hurt. Helen Castrilli and Louise Peterson work at the Tacoma, Washington State Hospital. Like most women, they have so-called women's jobs. Nurses and secretaries have always made a lot less than mechanics or carpenters who do so-called men's work. Penny Comstock Rowland, a supervisor at the state unemployment office, discovered that when she started out as a stenographer. People in clerical classifications were not treated accordingly to their worth. And I guess that's where comparable worth came from. <laughs> so along with Castrilli and Peterson and some others, she filed a class action suit based on a state study that showed Washington State was paying its women employees 20% less than the men. Comparable worth became big news. It's more than just equal pay for equal work. You have to pay women as much as men for doing the same job. That's the law. But what if the jobs are different, but the woman's work is just as valuable as the man's, requires the same skill and responsibility and effort? The principle of comparable worth is that the secretary to the president of a widget company ought to make just as much money as the truck driver who delivers the widgets. The Washington study found these jobs comparable in everything but money. 
Norma Jean Holmes gets $1,171 a month working in the laundry. Dan Henry gets $1,574 a month for driving the laundry truck. Lisa Montgomery counsels retarded children and makes $1,035. Kirk Hansen, maintenance man, gets $1,650. Federal Judge Jack Tanner thought that evidence enough to find Washington State guilty of, quote, institutionalized discrimination and ordered the state to make up the difference. It will cost several hundred million dollars to do that unless the U.S. Supreme Court decides otherwise. It was the Washington Federation of State Employees Council 28 of AFSCME created the terminology, identified the issue, developed the strategy of pursuing it, stayed with it, put resources behind it, involved its membership, and eventually was able to get a settlement agreement that reflected a major change in how compensation is made and to eliminate, to the extent the settlement agreement allows, the discriminatory practices based upon sex. The comparable worth pay equity installment started April 25, 1986, and continued more than six years, totaled nearly half a billion dollars. But 30 years later, the fight for pay equity goes on. We were the first to achieve such a victory, but today nationwide, women currently make only 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. 30 years after comparable worth, the United States Congress is considering pay the Paycheck Fairness Act. It will close the legal loopholes standing in the way of wage equity for women. We're better off today because of comparable worth, no doubt about it. And we must never forget what we accomplished in that great pay equity victory. But we must never quit building on it for a brighter future with fairness and equity. During the grand opening of Seattle's Husky Stadium light rail station, Federation Local 1488 joined in protest over the university's plan to dramatically raise the cost of the employee transit pass. Many university employees don't make enough to live in Seattle and commuting is expensive. A 43% increase is too much along with stagnant wages and increased health care costs. Well, we're trying to let the university know that we want the UPass to be affordable. Uh, they were told by the city to pay a uh, million and a half dollars in back taxes. They want the U-Pass holders to, to pay for that. That would raise our U-Pass 43%. We need the U-Pass to be affordable. They're a world-class organization. Um, they want to be the employer of choice. They need to make uh, the benefit of the U-Pass affordable to us, like all the other large employers in the city. The cost of living, it's getting less and less affordable to live in the city of Seattle. Uh, people, our members, are having having to move outside, which means they have to use transit to come, you know, come to work. Health care is going up, wages are pretty stagnant, so to add 43% to the youth pass is just too much money for our members to have to bear. AFL-CIO President Rich Trumka makes it clear which candidates Labor will support in the coming elections, including state and local elections. There's no mention of names or party affiliation. It's something much bigger than that. Any candidate who wants to appeal to workers has to put forth a bold and a comprehensive raising wages agenda. They must be committed to investing in a prosperous future for America. They must have an authentic voice and a commitment from the candidate down through his or her economic team to see this agenda through to completion. Workers don't want poll-driven messages. They want to be convinced that the candidate has an agenda for raising wages and will fight, will fight to make that agenda a reality. The International Labor Organization, an agency of the United Nations, commissioned a photo presentation on the plight of female domestic workers who leave poverty-stricken homes to find work in foreign lands only to be abused beyond belief. Because this is a project of the UN, names are not mentioned, but we will. 
Two of the worst abusers of foreign female domestic workers are Kuwait and our ally in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. Work there can mean hell on earth and the citizens of those countries should be ashamed. I wanted to do this project because I was angry at what I had heard, things that I had seen, and I thought it was really important that other people should see this. The first woman that I met when I started this project repeated the same things that I had been reading about for years, eight, nine years later, and they were saying the same things. I met three women who've been called a dog. I met a woman who'd been told that she could be killed and no one would know. I met women who had suffered such staggering abuse. I met a woman who came home in a wheelchair. She had to wheel herself to walk because they were too poor to afford medical treatment. I met a woman who was blind. She'd been made blind because she was hit with a metal pipe. We met another young woman who was perhaps sold or given away to a police official who should have known better. She has no idea how old she was. She was, couldn't have been much older than the child she was given to take care of. She was possibly seven. She didn't leave until maybe age 18. At one point, we met a pregnant woman who had been raped. Sexual abuse is common in these situations. And I met people like this because also they were mothers. They went out to be migrants and to work in another country so they could better educate their children, so they could feed their children. This woman had been abandoned by her husband. She was having a tough time and she was struggling to educate them and that's all she wanted was to educate her three daughters. And while she was abroad, the family tried to force her into a, a family-run brothel. And she fought back and they fought her and they beat her and they beat her. Worse, this woman's been abandoned by her family. Once they found out what had happened to her, they spit on her, they wanted nothing to do with her, and they walked away. I, I've heard about women who came home in a coma. I've heard about women who came home in a coffin. This abuse is lifelong. It isn't just a one-off. It isn't just about hitting a person once. The first step, I think, for change is, is that these Domestic work has to be recognized as work. They need to be treated like human beings. And right now, they're not being treated like human beings. They're being treated like property. They're being treated like barnyard animals or worse. I think Convention 189 is the beginning of huge change, huge change that has to come. Governments need to say to their societies that this kind of behavior and what is going on in the privacy of homes is unacceptable. They need to send a signal. How are they going to do that? It begins by ratifying the convention. And from that flows changes in laws, changes in, in procedures, and maybe somewhere down the road, changes in attitudes and the way society behaves toward other human beings. This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month.